the next speaker, who is my lao shi, my, my teacher, okay, uh, Professor Lisa Rafos from the University of California, Riverside. Um, so so to, to, to be very uh, Chinese about it, right, everything that, uh, that, that I say that is correct is from her. Everything that, is, uh, that I say that is wrong is all from me, <laughs> okay? <laughs> yeah, and, anyway, so, so Professor Lisa Rafos will be speaking on perspectives on ambiguity. So let's give her a round of applause. Thank you so much for inviting me here. Now, before beginning with either jokes or apologies, um, I think we, we will all as educators agree that one of the most satisfying things there is is to see our students come into their own. So I'm very, very happy. <laughs> um, but uh, now let me begin with an apology. Um, I have been brought into this project relatively late and the topic of ambiguity, is this loud enough by the way? The topic of ambiguity is itself so ambiguous and complex that it would be impossible to do it justice in a short time. Between that and uh, being, as it were, a nouveau arrivé to this matter, um, what I've tried to do is a kind of a bricolage of several case studies that bring out problems with the idea that somehow China or the East or something is more ambiguous than the West or something which is somehow clearer. So what I propose to do instead, because these kind of generalities scare me deeply, and I say this as someone who spent my whole career doing comparative work between Chinese and ancient Greek philosophy, so I have good reason to be scared. So what I want to do is to take three very specific examples to examine, well, what exactly is, ambi is ambiguous? The problem is that to do this properly, one has to go into detail. And so I'm going to have to ask your cooperation to deal with detail on some subjects that may seem a little bit strange. But before going into details, we should probably ask what ambiguity is. Um, and since this topic is given in English, I'm going to restrict myself to, to uh, the English. Now, the Oxford English Dictionary uh, defines ambiguity, first of all, as subjectivity. That is the wavering of an opinion, hesitation, doubt, or uncertainty. But you notice it says obs, meaning obsolete. So this is no longer, apparently, uh, how we use the term. Similarly, an uncertainty or a dubiety, obs. The current usage, we're told, is objectively. Uh, that is, uh, the c capability of being understood in two or more ways. Uh, double or dubious signification, but now it would seem from an objective point of view, not from the subjective point of view of uncertainty about one's meaning. Similarly, a word or phrase susceptible to more than one meaning, and another particular meaning in literary criticism that I'm not sure we need to worry about. It's worth noting that the change in meaning from the obsolete to the contemporary meanings is a shift Ah, okay. Is that better? Yes. Is a shift of the locus of the uncertainty from the subjective to the objective. Oops. My goal today is to argue three things. First of all, that ambiguity is no one's cultural property, whether this is a, an advantage or a disadvantage. Uh, secondly, that viewing ambiguity as a deficit, as the absence of something, is problematic. Uh, that uh, this, in fact, uh, may not be so much a Western prejudice as a prejudice arising out of the scientific revolution, that is a somewhat particular cultural moment. Um, I want to argue that ambiguity per se is neither a deficit nor a virtue. The devil is in the details. Thirdly, I want to um, argue that attributions of ambiguity can be the result of misunderstandings due to differences in conceptual or social or ritual systems. Uh, so let me turn to my first example. Um, and I'd like to play and look at two pieces of music. Um, the Bach Sonata No. 1 in G minor, in this case performed by an, in an early recording of Yehudi Menuhin, and um, a piece for the Gu Qin performed in this case by John Thompson, a contemporary uh, performer and musicologist. Um, 
Now, what, what this example is for is to look at ambiguity in the written transcription of music. So jazz isn't going to work here, nor will Indian ragas for that matter. May I ask how many people have played or play an instrument, and I include singing in the shower? <laughs> how many of you that have your hands up consult written music? So at least a certain, now of course we know, and I also see one of our, our uh, performance of this evening has raised his hand. Of course, written music isn't the same as a performance, but nonetheless, the question of what is clear or ambiguous in written music can be an interesting example to look at. So that's what I propose to do. Uh, so my first example is the Bach Sonata Number no. 1 in G minor, uh, which is uh, BVW 1001. Um, and this is recorded in between 1934 and 1936. And so let's look at what is clear and what is ambiguous in the notation of this music. Now, this is... There we are. Okay, so let's look at what is clear or ambiguous in the writing of this music. So first of all, um, we see the clef here. This is the treble clef, uh, that is the G or treble clef. So that tells us one type of notation for the notes. We also have the key signature, in this case B flat here, one flat, which indicates what scale is being used. We have the time signature, 16 over 16 here, um, which indicates 16 beats per measure, and that the beat is defined by the 16th note here. Now notice that each individual note, and there's many notes in this piece, is specified as to its pitch, that is the position of the note on the clef here, uh, including the ledger lines that extend the notes above or below the clef, for example, here or here. Um, the duration, that is how long each sound lasts, right? These are 16th, uh, I'm looking for a whole note. Uh, uh, these are all pretty fast, but there's a few, this is a, um, uh, a one beat note. Um, so these are expressed in five symbols, the whole half, quarter, eighth, and 16th notes, and corresponding symbols for rest. Um, for the same five durations. And also these notes can be combined to produce intermediate durations. There are also Italian notations in the music, which tell us something about, first of all, the genre or form of the music. Uh, for example, whether it's an aria or a concerto. This one is a sonata. Some of these words, of course, have made their way into normal English usage. There are other indications that indicate tempo. For example, adagio here. Um, uh, terms like ritardendo, slowing down, presto, very fast. There are other terms in Italian that indicate the dynamics of the piece. Crescendo, becoming louder. Forte, going to fortissimo, very loud. There are other indications that indicate the mood of the piece. Now, they're not all in this piece. Cantabile, for example, uh, singable or scherzando, playfully. There are other indications in, the, in not necessarily this piece that indicate the bowing, the right hand technique, pizzicato, the plucking of the instrument, um, or information uh, about bowing, or vibrato, that the, that the note is um, uh, vibrated. So to sum up, when we look at the information that is clear in this score, it gives extremely clear information about pitch and timing, with some additional information about the overall phrasing of the music. Now let me turn to another example. 
this piece is um, a piece for the Gu Qin, um, uh, Zi Ye Wu Ge, or the Zi Ye Song of Wu. The lyrics are by the great Tang poet Li Bai. And this is the autumn poem, that is, there's a poem for each of the four seasons. Um, and, th and this poem is also found in the uh, Tang Shi San Bai Shou, that is, the, hundred tang, um, the 300 Tang Poems collection. Uh, this recording was recorded by John Thompson, and if you're interested, it and much more can be found at the website silkchin.com. Now, what information do we get from the score of this piece? First of all, in terms of genre, it's from one of many handbooks for playing the chin. This particular one is Japanese, which typically include not only pieces of music, but chapters on the broader context. For example, the construction of the chin, how to tune the instrument, left and right hand techniques, and even rules for when to play it and when not to play it. For example, of the 14 appropriate and inappropriate times for playing it, appropriate times include having climbed a mountain, presumably carrying it along, or when there is a bright moon. Inappropriate times include during a solar or lunar eclipse, and that one should not play it for a barbarian. Um, but what does the score tell us? Um, it seems to tell us very, very much less. We might say it's more ambiguous than the score we just looked at. The right-hand column here gives the lyrics of the poem. This goes up to down, right to left, uh, which consists of six lines in the same meter, and any poem of the same metrical structure could be played to this music. Uh, now, I've added boxes to indicate the lines, the first, second, third, uh, fourth, fifth. Um, now, to the left, and you notice they don't completely correspond, uh, we have the music, and this seems like very, very little, doesn't it, uh, in comparison. Um, and that's it. So what then does the music, the musical notation tell us? Before turning to that, I wanted to mention a remark by the Dutch uh, diplomat, Robert van Gulik, who wrote one of the few studies of the chin in Western languages. Uh, in a piece published in Tokyo in 1938, he explains how the guqin differs from other Chinese musical instruments. So we don't have a univocal, timeless East here. We have a particular tradition. Um, and the qin differs from other instruments because its melodic structures are differently accessible. And as he said, whose music is, uh, that other Chinese instruments have music that is easily understood. The qin, on the contrary, is not so easy to appreciate, chiefly because its music is not primarily melodical. Its beauty lies not so much in the succession of notes as in each separate note itself. Painting with sounds might be a way to describe its essential quality. And by the way, I don't necessarily agree with him uh, in putting it this way. Uh, each note is an entirety in itself, calculated to evoke in the mind um, of the hearer a special reaction. The timbre being thus of utmost importance, there were very great possibilities for modifying the coloring of one in the same tone. And this is the important point, this last sentence, that here the precision is in the dynamics of each note of the piece. So how is this accomplished? Oh no, pardon me, I'm having trouble with this again. Now when we go back uh, to if we go back to the notation, uh, sorry, if we go back to the notation, these are the, these are the notes. So what sort of information are they clear about? Um, when we look at some of these, and these are, these are the first notes of the piece. Oh, pardon. This component here on the left gives the instruction for the left hand, and this tells us that it's an open string. The lower component gives instruction for the right. It tells us that um, the, uh, the fifth string is used, the number five, and that the stroke is go, which is uh, a stroke with the middle finger moving toward the performer. Similarly, the next note, uh, the open string notation is carried forward, but this is on the seventh string, but here the stroke is tiao, with the, ind with the index finger going out. 
The next uh, note, um, the third note has a somewhat more complicated instruction. The upper part here indicates that the left hand is using the big finger, that is the uh, index finger, at the ninth position. Um, but you notice that the notation does not say which string the left hand finger is placed on. But that information appears in the lower part, which specifies that the right hand uses this stroke go, same as above, uh, to pluck the sixth string using vibrato, but using a swift vibrato rather than a larger vibrato. Um, and um, we can go through all of these other, um, uh, these other notations, which I think in the interest of time and your patients late in the day, I won't do. But if people want to come back to it, we can. The, the point I want to make is that every single note that the method of producing the note is specified not for the phrase as a whole, but the expressiveness is specified note by note. However, there's something that seems to be missing here. There's absolutely no time signatures, are there? There's absolutely no information as to how long each note should be maintained. So, um, this perhaps excessively detailed look at the chin score allows us to compare two kinds of ambiguity. Going back to the Bach, we see that there is no direction for the position um, of the right hand and very, uh, sorry, there's no direction for the position on the instrument of the left hand. Now in student versions there might be, but in an actual score there is not. And there's very little direction for the expressiveness of the right hand. So in this sense, the box score is ambiguous. The Italian directions describe the expression of the whole, but by contrast, the Chinese score gives detailed instructions for the performance and feel the sound picture, if you like, of every single note. So in that sense, it's far more precise, but it gives absolutely no, no indication of how long each note should be held so that individual performances vary quite a bit. So in other words, the two traditions of musical notations are ambiguous about very different things. Expression and method of performance in the box score is ambiguous, and timing in the chin score. So neither one is inherently ambiguous or inherently clear. Finally, we cannot, we cannot fairly characterize the ambiguous aspects of either score as either a deficit or an advantage. Each presents different opportunities for the interpretive skill of the performer, and also opportunities for instruction in the transmission of music from teacher to student. Teachers show their students uh, the best violent hand positions and their understanding of the timing of the chin pieces. So here is again a case where ambiguity is not a cultural property in either case. So both examples can be described as clear and both examples can be described as ambiguous. And secondly, that ambiguity in each score offers, offers opportunities as well as gaps. Let me move to my second example. This is just a list of different uh, chin symbols for the right hand. There's, as you can see, a lot of them. And I think time and interest doesn't go into their doesn't allow their details. Uh, let me turn to my second example um, of ambiguity and clarity in grammar and syntax, which is a slightly different issue than that that Dr. Gao talked about yesterday. Now, my second example um, turns to the problem of being clear on what we do and do not know. In other words, in some cases, ambiguity may in fact be clearer than a false clarity. This point is made in two quotations, and by the way, I can't find them in their original, uh, by um, uh, the great physicist uh, Niels Bohr, one of the 20th century's pioneers in atomic structure and quantum mechanics. Truth, uh, truth and clarity are complementary. Never express yourself more clearly than you are able to think. So Bohr makes the case that one can have a false clarity, that precision is not the only goal in being clear. So in other words, if we're more specific than we really know, we may misrepresent, whereas ambiguity may in fact present a more accurate picture of what we do and do not know. 
So now I turn to an example from a comparison of how classical Chinese and Indo-European languages in general handle issues of number, gender, and tense. Now again, let's consider the stereotype that classical Chinese is ambiguous because its grammar does not inflect verbs or decline nouns. Uh, as, as contrasted to Indo-European languages. So I'm, let me give an example of this. this is, these are the opening lines of the Iliad of Homer, which I hope at least some of you have read. Um, and what I want to call your attention to is this part where it here, that is the, the bard is uh, invoking the muse to sing about the wrath of Achilles, ruinous wrath, etc., uh, that hurled the souls of heroes to their deaths um, and the plan of Zeus was fulfilled from the time when first they too stood apart quarreling, the son of Atreus, that is Agamemnon, and Achilles. And this is the layout of the plot of the Iliad. Um, now, because of its grammatical requirements, classical Greek is very clear about certain points. The muse to whom the bard prays is singular. Thea is in the accusative singular, uh, as is Achilles that is, uh, sing of the wrath of Achilles, and this is genitive singular. So we know there's only one Achilles. Um, the sufferings of the Achaeans, the Algea, are plural. Um, and the souls hurled down to Hades likewise, and the bodies left for the dogs and birds of prey to eat. And the ones who stood apart quarreling are in the dual. That is, classical Greek, like Sanskrit and Indo-European, has three numbers, singular, plural, and dual. So you use the dual when you mean precisely two. Um, so in, in this case, the author has to be clear about whether it's one, two, or more than one. Um, so we know uh, grammatically, that there was a quarrel between two men, even before they're specified in the text. So classical Greek allows us to specify whether something is one, two, um, or more than two. But it also forces to specify one of those things. Even if we have no idea how many it was, we are required by the grammar to give something a number. Now let's turn um, to an example from classical Chinese. Now, classical Chinese does not he have these. May I call them constraints? Um, for this reason, it might seem to be more ambiguous. Here's an example from a recent study by the um, uh, originally Chinese Hong Kong scholar uh, Tsai uh, Zongqi on a four-character statement by Mencius in um, 5a on how to interpret the Shu Jing, the book of poetry. The context is a discussion about the saying that a scholar of complete virtue may not be employed as a minister by a sovereign or treated as a son by his father. And the, the question is about the applicability of this uh, saying to Yao and Shun, and Yao specifically choosing Shun as his successor. Now, Mencius' interlocutor um, replies with a Shu Jing quotation. Um, which ends, uh, sorry, he says that um, I've already gotten your point that Shun did not treat Yao as his subject, but the odes say, under the entire heaven, there is no land that is not the king's. Uh, there is no man that is not the king's subject. Now, um, Professor Tsai goes on to say, one should use what one construes from a text to, trans to trace the author's intent and thereby get to the meaning of a poem. Now the problem in this is that there are, four, that there are different understandings of the terms uh, e, ni, je. So the problem is who's e and who's je. Uh, and the ambiguity of this statement has created a situation where Mencius' quotation has been praised by people of widely diverging points of view. Um, E could denote conception, speculation, imagination, or textual meaning. Ni has been understood both as actively traced back to and passively wait to meet something. Ji has been glossed as either moral intent or simply feelings. So at the level, um, uh, there's also a, a problem with the lack of possessives. Without them, it's impossible to be sure whose E and Ji Mencius was talking about. So as a result, we get very different accounts of the meaning of the phrase. 
On one view, Mencius made the statement to show his, uh, his pupil how to correctly interpret a Shujing poem in the light of its original meaning. Um, now, in the interest of time, I won't go through uh, Professor Tsai's very interesting argument. The point for our purposes is Tsai's point that this maxim has been praised by critic of, critics of opposing points of view for nearly a millennium. The reason, Tsai suggests, is the extraordinarily versatility of the phrase, which is linked to, as he puts it, the rich inherent ambiguity of uninflected classical Chinese. So Tsai's point is that by adroitly exploiting the ambiguities um, of, of classical Chinese grammar, as well as the syntax of the statement, traditional Chinese critics continually reinterpreted Mencius' statement in ways that justified their own interpretive approaches. However, classical Chinese can also be highly specific. Uh, these are the lyrics of the Chen piece that we listened to a moment ago. This poem is very short and very evocative. We might expect it to be ambiguous, but it demonstrates handily how classical Chinese can be as precise as it wants to be when it wants to. The poem makes it clear that not only is there one moon over Chang'an, Chang which we would expect, it's not Mars after all, but there's a single slice of moon, a very clear image of the crescent moon. We don't know whether it's waxing or waning, but it doesn't particularly matter. Now, it tells us that the sound of 10,000 households pounding cloth, that is to do laundry. Now, is this sound singular or plural? Are we hearing one sound or many when we hear the pounding of, of uh, women doing laundry at night? I would again argue that we actually get a clearer image by not knowing, by not having to overspecify this point, whether the sound of 10,000 women beating, uh, beating laundry is one sound or multiple sounds. If, we were do if this poem were in Greek, we would be forced to specify, but here we're not. Um, so choosing uh, one of these alternatives doesn't give us anything. We don't need to know whether the autumn wind that blows without end um, is one wind or several winds. Clarity on this point would be useful to a meteorologist, but it would actually obscure our understanding of the poem. In English, by contrast, we would be forced to make an artificial choice between wind and winds, for example. Or the female speaker's absent husband uh, is grammatically ambiguous, but it's very clear who she's talking about. So to conclude with this example, the potential for grammatical and syntactic ambiguity, which are more marked in the grammar and syntax of classical Chinese than in Indo-European languages, does not mean that classical Chinese is required to be more ambiguous than an Indo-European language, only that it can be, can as it were, uh, in the local idiom. Uh, it should be remarked here that Indo-European languages also differ among themselves on how much grammatical and syntactic specificity they require. The reason for this um, is, the, um, it, is, the, um, is that the ambiguity in a language is different from the choice of when and how to use it. And creative poets and others in Indo-European languages and classical Chinese also find ways to get around the hyperspecificity of their grammar or the ambiguity of their grammar. Uh, so again, neither tradition is inherently more or less ambiguous than the other. I now turn to my third example, and I'd like everyone for just a moment to take fingers of one hand and to place them on the wrist of the other. I'm hoping that everyone here has a pulse or pulses, and take a moment to feel yours. Now my third example, draws on a problem of commensurable or incommensurable models of the body. Here, ambiguity answers because incommensurable or semi-commensurable systems and modes of demonstration produce impressions of ambiguity. Um, now, the first point to notice is I'm hoping that everyone here does have a pulse. Um, it's not necessarily the case that we can all feel it in the same way. For example, somebody who uh, had the misfortune to have only one arm would not be able to do this exercise. Um, but the majority of us who can feel our pulse or pulses in this manner, and notice that I'm forced to choose between the singular and the plural, what does it tell us? 
Pulse taking is part of a standard medical examination, but what does it tell us and how clear or ambiguous is it? This question can be broken down into two others, what it tells us and what models of the body inform that information. Both are potential sites for ambiguity. So let's then look at three different views of the pulse. According to the pulse measurement entry in the website WebMD, which is where this comes from, uh, your we have someone having their pulse checked. Um, and why is this done? To see how well the heart is working. In an emergency, uh, the pulse rate can help find out if the heart is pumping enough blood. It can help find the cause of symptoms, such as an irregular or rapid heartbeat, dizziness, fainting, etc. It can check for blood flow after an injury or when a blood vessel may be blocked. It can check on medicines or diseases that, are, that manifest as a slow heart rate. And it can check general health. Um, let's turn to a different example, the pulse in ancient Greece. Now we all have pulses, but we use them for very different reasons. We see a very different view of pulse taking um, uh, in Greek medicine in the fourth century BC in the works of the Cohen physician Praxagoras, who is considered to be the first to establish a link between pulses and disease, at least in the Western tradition. His student, Herophilus of Chalcedon, brought these ideas to Alexandria and extended them by introducing a musical uh, taxonomy to describe them. Um, and inventing a portable water clock, notice a time measurement device, to measure them. He's credited with metaphorical names for particular pulses, such as the gazelle pulse and the water hammer pulse. No ancient text specifically attributes these names to him, but they resemble the metaphorical or even fanciful terms that are attributed to him, and his works don't survive. Now, a story that does survive is the story of Erisistratus of, of uh, Ceos' diagnosis of the malady of the prince Antiochus I, uh, the son of Seleucus uh, I of Syria, about 294 BC. Seleucus's elder son, Antiochus, falls, falls ill, and no one, none of the court doctors, could explain what ailed him. Here we see uh, Jacques Louis David's 1774 rendition of this scene. Uh, Erisistratus is, is, first of all, feeling the pulse, and this isn't, there he is, there's the prince. Um, um, and um, we also see a young and beautiful woman. Uh, Seleucus, his father, has uh, uh, subsequently married a young and beautiful woman named Aristonike, and Antiochus has fallen head over heel in love head over heels in love with her, that is, with his new mother-in-law. But he conceals these feelings and chooses to be ill in silence instead. However, they took their toll over time. Now here things get complicated. Uh, for various political reasons, it's somewhat awkward for Erisistratus to explain what's really ailing the prince. Erisistratus instead tells his patron that his son's disease was incurable because it was due to impossible love. When Seleucus asked who it was that the prince was in love with, Erisistratus named his own wife. And Seleucus tried to persuade him to give her over to the prince. Erisistratus asked if, in the same circumstances, Seleucus would do the same thing, that is, give over his own wife to the prince. And he says that he would. At this point, Erisistratus tells him the truth, that in fact it is the, the wife of Seleucus who is the object of the infatuation and that his son has been willing to die rather than disclose what really ailed him. And you notice we see Erisistratus pointing at Aristonike here in the rhetoric of the painting. The story here ends happily. Seleucus gave up Stratonike to his son, as well as several provinces of his empire. Erisistratus is said to have received a hundred talents, that is of gold, for being the means of restoring the prince to health, which might amount to one of the largest medical fees on record. Now, this episode appears in the work of several ancient authors, similar anecdotes that portray a physician using the pulse to make a difficult diagnosis are told with varying degrees of likelihood about Hippocrates and Galen, but time doesn't permit going into these variants. 
But to put such stories in perspective that's useful for our discussion of ambiguity, I want to turn briefly to the account of the pulse by one of the greatest Greek physicians of antiquity, Galen of Pergamon. In his works on prognosis and diagnosis, Galen says that he follows the model of Hippocrates, um, and specifically that Hippocrates in his epidemics has described all the critical days uh, in each illness to his final conclusion. Now the issue here is identifying the critical day, that is the day at which a especially a fever takes the turn of breaking and getting better or resulting in death. And Greek medicine of this time actually couldn't do much to relieve these fevers, but there was a great um, emphasis put on accurate prognosis. But Galen adds that in one place, Hippocratic repertoires uh, of diagnosis uh, are weak, and that is that they don't include any theory of the pulses. Now, Galen considered his own development of pulse diagnosis as his greatest contribution to diagnostic medicine. His own skill is emphasized in case histories and throughout his own clinical works, which are extensive, and again, in the interest of time, I won't go into them in detail. He also gives various detailed expositions of various matters concerned with the pulse in a series of treatises. Now, Galen tried to correlate different types of pulses with specific diseases. He used categories such as speed, rhythm, and tension, as well as metaphors probably derived from Herophilus, uh, including the mouse tail pulse, the ant like pulse, and the double hammer pulse. Galen claimed to personally have a very sensitive touch through experience that he considered an important aid to diagnosis and claimed to be able to feel the stages in the dilation and contraction of an artery between systole and diastole. In one famous incident, the peripatetic uh, philosopher Eudemus became ill, and Galen, who lived nearby, uh, went to see him because he considered him his teacher. Now, Galen was reluctant to take Eudemus's pulse because he didn't know the normal pulse, so he wouldn't be able to feel what was irregular or wrong with it. But nonetheless, he eventually confirms his suspicion of quartan fever. Now, according to Galen, a physician should observe the strength, frequency, speed, and rhythm of the pulse. That is four factors that one could observe, and he claimed to be able to observe very precisely. And he described how, uh, how to take the pulse, the kinds of pulses, and what causes variation in the pulses. Now, according to Galen, the size of the pulse uh, consisted in the length, breadth, and height, that is, three dimensions of each thing. So the dilation of an artery might be excessive or deficient along each of these three dimensions, that is, length, breadth, and height. And he claimed to be able to feel all of them. <coughs> Excuse me. Excessive dilation might be too long, too broad, too high. Insufficient dilation might be too short, too narrow, or too low. On Galen's understanding, the speed of the pulse reflected the distance the arterial uh, wall moved and the time it took to do so. So for Galen, a pulse had four parts. The diastole, the rest between it and the systole, the systole and the rest between it and the next diastole. Now, in a study of Galen's case histories, the historian of medicine, Jeffrey Lloyd, notes four important points about Galen's pulse taking and prognosis. First, he stresses the need to be familiar with a patient's normal pulse patterns in order to be able to detect abnormalities. That is, that's why Galen was reluctant to take the pulse of Eudemus. He didn't have that basic information. Um, secondly, Lloyd emphasizes that the pulse can indicate a, a disturbance of the psyche, such as we had in the case of Erisistratus diagnosis of the love malady of the prince. But there is no pulse that means a person is in love. Now here he refers specifically to the story of Erisistratus, who was his own competitor. Third, he notes that physicians make important errors by misidentifying pulses as large, swift, slow, weak, etc., because they misunderstand types of pulses based on the diastole of the heart. And finally, and most important, Galen's emphasis on the importance of pulse diagnosis tells us very little about what he actually feels when he takes a patient's pulse. All he tells us is that he took it and that he used it on, uh, on the basis of his predictions, and that he was always right. Now, Galen's interest in the pulse was centrally concerned with a theory of the different roles of the arteries and veins. 
uh, that is, the double and compound motions of the arteries, which we call the pulse, he says, is governed by the heart. Um, as we are, um, uh, as we ourselves uh, are elsewhere, and many others before us have de demonstrated. It is not so, however, in the manner supposed by Aristotelus, but as uh, both Herophilus and, and Hippocrates and nearly all the most esteemed of the ancient physicians and philosophers believed. For that power which is in the body of the heart, by which it expands and contracts, flowing out through um, their coats, all of the arteries expands and contracts, just as it does the heart. So this passage shows that the heart is responsible for the power of the pulse. Erisistratus, too, was interested in anatomy and is credited with descriptions of the valves of the heart, the understanding of its function as a pump, and the distinction between veins and arteries. Now, the point of all this is that both Erisistratus and Galen were anatomists. They linked their understanding of the pulse to the working of the heart. Now, to see why that's important, we need to turn to a counterexample, that is, the understandings of the pulse in early China. In traditional Chinese medicine, taking the pulses is one of the four examinations, the others being looking, listening, and smelling, and asking. Um, in brief, medical texts describe eight pulse locations and 28 pulse types. As described in the Huangdi Suan and the Huangdi Lingshu, that is the two ancient parts of the Huangdi Neijing, uh, the first text on uh, medicine, palpation of the pulses occurs on both wrists. Several chapters describe other sites and techniques for taking the pulse. For each wrist, there are three locations, that is the inch, um, uh, the inch, the gate, um, Uh, and the foot. So there's a, so each wrist has all three, um, and two depths floating and sunken, leading to a total of 12 pulses, which are used to diagnose the condition of the 12 visceral systems. That is, the organs in the body cavity, plus the systems of conduits or meridians that bring the chi of the visceral systems throughout the body. And so here's a summary of this information, of, of which positions... Uh, Govern, uh, govern which of the organs. So this chart then uh, gives six lo uh, gives um, for each wrist six locations. So that is uh, a total of twelve different locations for identifying the pulse quality of each organ system. In addition to that, there are twenty-eight pulse qualities. Several of them involve depth, that is, floating or sinking, but also speed, width, strength, shape, length, rhythm, moderate pulse, flooding, minute, frail, etc. So again, we have a much more detailed description of the, the quality and nature of the pulses than we find in either the biomedical account or the ancient Greek account. Um, Again, time doesn't permit going into the intricacies of this matter, but again, let's consider the ways that ambiguity manifests in early Chinese, Greek, and modern touching of the pulse. Returning to Galen and Erisistratus, what did they feel for? Well, Galen doesn't tell us, but they identified pulses as large, swift, slow, weak, and strong, etc. Contemporary physicians primarily take the pulse to measure timing and strength. But Erisistratus and Galen's claims for the pulse are closely linked to their claims about anatomy. And as uh, the Japanese uh, historian of science, uh, Shigehisa Koriyama, puts it, anatomy shaped how and what the fingers felt. As Koriyama argues in a wonderful book called The Expressiveness of the Body and the Divergence of Greek and Chinese Medicine, Greek anatomist physicians framed the study of the pulse as an aspect of anatomy linked to claims about the heart, the veins, and arteries, and also their separation from the nervous system. So we may say that they were very precise about the anatomy behind the pulse, but as Lloyd remarks, they say rather little about how or where the pulses were actually palpated and interpreted. In this sense, they're rather ambiguous. The Chinese texts, by contrast, are extremely precise in linking very specific pulse locations, depths, and pulse qualities to the 12 visceral systems of the body. And those of you familiar with acumoxa know that the points for treatment on the body are highly precise in both location and depth. 
Uh, I'm guessing that some people in this room have, have been needled uh, or had uh, moxibustion. But the systematic view of the body behind these methods of diagnosis and treatment are more ambiguous on anatomy, which is not its primary focus of concern. Kur Kuriyama makes this point extremely well um, in his description of two entirely different views of the body, which he uses as the frontispiece of his book. The illustration on the left by Andreas Vesalius shows a man with no skin striding through a classical landscape. He has bulging muscles um, and highly articulated limbs and joints. You see his hands. Uh, the illustration on the right shows a middle-aged scholar uh, with many of the acumoxa points noted um, along the meridians, but not a sign of anything that I can see as a single muscle uh, or any other an anatomical feature. For purposes of our discussion, the point is that our tactile feeling of the pulse and the medical systems behind it reflect three very different understandings of the body that are specific and ambiguous about very different aspects of something that I, we all share, that is, I'm guessing everyone here has a body. So to conclude, these three very different examples are intended to demonstrate three points. First, we cannot make broadly cultural claims about ambiguity. Second, incorrect claims often arise when we start from one system, look at another, and find it ambiguous or deficient in some particular respect, because its gaze is different than our own. One remedy for this problem is careful comparison, about which a great deal more could be said. And this brings me to my third and final point, that much of the instruction and interest is in looking at the details and foci of ambiguities and specificities of different cultural systems and moments. Thank you for your attention. Okay, so we have time for some questions. Any questions, anyone? Um, okay, well, maybe while you ruminate, I, I can say that, that this, this talk has actually brought back a lot of nostalgic memories. Uh, remember my class, we, we took a class by, her, by Prof. Rufos on uh, ancient Greek medicine and we read the text of Hippocrates and our co conclusion at every class was that we we're going to die, that we're all dying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, anyway, it's, it's a fun text to read if you have the time. Any questions, anyone? Thank you for sharing about the Eastern and Western approaches. In NTU, I understand they actually have um, they actually teach traditional Chinese medicine in a degree program. At the same time, they are these students are also exposed to Western science. Mm -hmm. In terms of uh, in US, are there any leading universities that are advocating uh, a study of these complementary or these forms of medicine, the East and the West, or it could be it not, it not necessarily be the East and the West. It could also be like um, osteopathy and medical science um, in that context of complementary? Well, first of all, I should say I live in California, which from a certain point of view is part of greater China. So our, <laughs> our east-west um, <laughs> issue breaks down there. But with, having made that disclaimer, as it happens, I have several former students that went on to acupuncture school. And as, 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 as getting their training as acupuncturists, they studied biochemistry. They studied anatomy. That is, although they're not being trained as Western physicians, there is a certain level of knowledge that they were required to get as part of their acupuncture training. Um, I believe that some hospitals, and I think one of the major Boston hospitals, um, has programs that involve um, some, not so much teaching of acupuncture, but use of acupuncture. Now, there's another side of all of this, which is uh, medicine is also um, a financial proposition. One of the things that matters is what, you, what your insurance will cover, right? And um, American systems differ very, very much, and most of them don't cover much acupuncture. I, th I'm, I'm, I think the situation here is much better, isn't it? Uh, but there are some that do, although it tends to be more limited. So there's a bunch of issues of legitimation of, the ki of this financial kind. And there, there's, I, I mean, these things are licensed by state. Uh, I believe that acupuncturists requ are required to take licensing examinations in, I think, every state. I know, I know someone in, who used to be in Texas and um, people in California. I mean, the, the rules vary by state, but I think all states have them. And I know the UK now has them. It didn't used to. Um, so, I mean, that's another side of the question. Um, I know that there is in China a great deal of interest. Uh, there are medical programs, for example, that teach biomedically trained physicians acupuncture. 
Um, and there are very, there are various, there's also a huge initiative to try to find the uh, active ingredients in a variety of traditional herbal medicines, um, artemisin, for example, being one example. Um, but uh, there is a problem still involving very, very different understandings of the body. That is, the pulse is one example. But the problem is that the, the models of the components of the body are quite different, and lots of problems arise. Um, but so I'd say that, you know, the, there are programs, but they vary in different states. And there are also, I think, programs in Europe. Um, so this is um, something that is, I think, in development. Uh, it's part of the interest, actually, of, of this morning's talk, uh, that there seem to be possibilities of models of diagnosis and treatment that might ultimately incorporate both systems. Um, but this is, uh, I think, still very much a work in progress. Okay. You said ambiguity is a very ambiguous subject, so I don't know where my question is going to lie, but in um, Western education, uh, the way I, I, I got brought up, there was always some kind of negative connotation to ambiguity, like any ex explanation we give, if it is a bit ambiguous, we tend to be asked to be more clear, uh, clear or clarify, because it seems that we don't understand everything if we are ambiguous in in the approach of science or whatever. So I, I wanted to ask your opinion on the difference between the vision of ambiguity on the West or the East, or if there is some kind of different vision of ambiguity. Like if, I don't know if it's clear <laughs> what I'm saying. Well, I think one problem that arises is speaking about the West and the East. For example, um, one looks at the large number of people trained in biomedicine in a whole variety of sciences, both in China and people of Chinese ethnicity or other Asian ethnicities in the West. So, so a particular system of knowledge is no one's cultural property. But if we look at attitudes toward ambiguity in cultural systems, it seems to me that some of this may be an artifact of the so-called scientific revolution, that is, uh, an, an enormously productive mathematization about nature, uh, the results of which we all benefit from. However, that isn't to say that everything can or should be described precisely. And I think Bohr's quotation, but, um, uh, after all, this by one of the great scientists of the 20th century, um, that truth and clarity are, are, are complementary and that you shouldn't express yourself more clearly than what you actually know. Um, there is a scene in the play, uh, The Birds of Aristophanes, that uh, describes Socrates being hyper precise by trying to measure the jump of a flea. That is, he may be able to do it, but it's not to say that this is useful or valuable. So although I think in our education, this, you're, you're absolutely right, I think this is a, one of these misnomers and misidentifications that may be more of an artifact of a certain kind of modernity than anything having to do with East or West. Looking at um, the, the subject of uh, medicine, uh, ap ap apart uh, from uh, and, and also music and other things, um, but particularly medicine. Uh, one thing that seems to stand out uh, for myself, uh, ap apart from this uh, discussion on ambiguity and um, perhaps uh, clarity, um, there's also uh, this uh, aspect, which is uh, when we look at uh, Chinese medicine versus, let's say, uh, uh, Greek, uh, the Greeks were into, uh, I think, Italians as so, um, you know, dissecting the body, looking at the individual muscles, different organs, so forth. Uh, Chinese probably did a little bit of that. There are stories about someone who was shot in war by a poisonous arrow and then, you know, had to be operated on, and so forth. But not to the same extent, I feel. Uh, the thing that stands out in my mind is more... Um, the, the, the Chinese approach of uh, looking at the person as an as a integrated whole uh, rather than, like some, for instance, let's say someone has got a uh, pain here or there, uh, they're, they're more uh, uh, you know, prone to look at the, the whole body, you know, what, 
what could it be that's causing this issue? Whereas uh, maybe the Western approach might be more like symptomatic, uh, high temperature, okay, fine, let's see, well, what would reduce the temperature, right? Whereas the, uh, the Chinese looks more like, uh, you know, is the person uh, like heaty? Is that why he's having this fever, you know? So how do I treat the person so that the whole sort of body would be uh, tuned up, you know, uh, to, uh, so that as a consequence of that, then this symptom might go away. I, that, that's, I, I get that perception, uh, rightly or wrongly. Yeah. And uh, so, so, so in, it, it's a more sort of overall view than a more sort of a, a localized view of, of focusing on the symptoms and treating the symptoms. Yeah. I get well, that perception. Well, I think what you say is absolutely right. And, uh, and my knowledge of the details of this is very limited, but at the same time, when a, uh, a TCM physician makes a diagnosis, although he or she takes into account many more factors perhaps than some Western doctors do, including one's lifestyle, one's state of mind, one's relations with one's family. Nonetheless, the techniques of diagnosis are not without specificity. That is, the taking of the pulses is very precise. The notion of the, one's coloring, the diagnosis of an excess of, or deficit of yin and yang in one or more of the visceral systems and various other very, very um, detailed accounts of, of the origin of illness. So although you're, I think you're absolutely right that there's a, a view of the whole person, that's not to say that there isn't a great deal of specificity in diagnosis. Thank you very much. It's a very interesting topic. Uh, I just want to follow Diana's question uh, whether this ambiguity is related to culture. Uh, some cultures are not tolerant to, to to the ambiguity to a certain degree. Others tend to be tolerant more. And I happen to know that in 1977, there was a book written by uh, Geet Hofstad, a Dutch anthropologist. He did conduct a study among 58 countries. He, made, uh, he used five dimensions to uh, examine the tolerance of ambiguity using 1 to 100 a scale. And he, com he came up with a list on the top five uh, countries, the cultures that uh, you know, can tolerate ambiguity most. Uh, uh, first is Singapore. So <laughs> Singapore can tolerate ambiguity most. And then is Jamaica, a, a country in Latin America. And then Denmark, and then Sweden, and then Hong Kong. So these hmm. five cultures are on the top that can tolerate ambiguity most. And then at the bottom are the countries like uh, Greece, Portugal, Guatemala, Hungary, and Belgium. So this study was conducted about 20 years ago, but unfortunately so far there haven't been other studies that can support this uh, you know, uh, big project results. Thank you. Thank you so much, this is wonderful. Um, but a question arises which is about methodology, that is how did they measure ambiguity? Was it in language, was it in social practices? The subject is so broad that it seems to me many questions could be asked. Um, so, I mean, I, my own impulse is to become immediately skeptical with these sort of neat, um, uh, quantif quantifiable accounts of which and c cultures or nationalities are the most or least tolerant of ambiguity because the question arises as to what was actually studied. But it's still fascinating. Thank you so much for like a really fascinating, wide-ranging perspective on ambiguity. Um, I'd, I'd love to add another observation point from from the standpoint of uh, another life of mine, which is as an AI cognitive science researcher. So, so I build these large scale machines that learn language and music. Uh, if you use Google Translator, Yahoo Translator, or Microsoft Translate, that sort of thing, um, we pioneered that kind of mathematical model, build it first. Uh, 
model that tried to learn entirely by itself the relationship between English and Chinese well enough so that you could translate that. And in that community, um, we, we talk about nothing but handling ambiguity because that, that's the whole challenge. Very interesting contrast between English, Chinese, and other languages. So we started, we, we built the first of these kinds of machines about 20, almost 25 years ago um, on English and Chinese. In 2000, 2001, uh, the, the U.S. suddenly had this panic after 9-11 and decided that it was going to throw in huge amounts of funding on Arabic to English uh, learning of, of automatic translation. This was five to ten years after all the work we'd done on Chinese to English. Within four years, the accuracy of Arabic to English translation was twice as good as for Chinese to English. And so we were being dragged onto pa scientific panels year after year. Why is Chinese so hard to translate? And of course, the, the um, quantitative analyses that were being done on what was creating the errors was the really interesting part. That was the ambiguity of Chinese language. And it really is a quantifiable lack of explicit information that happened with much greater frequency than in Arabic and in all of the other Indo-European languages that we were tackling. What sort of texts were you using? Uh, there are a lot of different kinds of texts, uh, a lot of different corpora. Hmm. So these are, uh, some of them are governmental, some of them are um, Twitter, social media, some mm -hmm. of them are Newswire. Uh, so the same results disturbingly have held for all of those. Do you have any sense as to how much the difference had to do with different grammatical categories? Because I, I, I doesn't, isn't Arabic a highly inflected and declined language? Indeed, yeah. And that's one, so, so um, I'll just give you a couple of examples of the kinds of ambiguity. So one is that you have inflectional morphology in most Indo-European languages and Semitic languages that helps you to disambiguate mm -hmm. what role each mm -hmm. constituent is actually playing. Um, but another um, thing is like in Chinese, for example, you have this wonderful particle, da, which pretty much you can connect anything with. And it means everything from in to for to of to apostrophe s to ge you know, genitive to, uh, and it basically says there's some relationship between these two things, something to something. Mm -hmm. And uh, in English, that would more often be realized as a specific preposition or uh, some sort of you know, relative. Uh, so to interpret for, for, for a machine model to be able to interpret that, it has to do the same thing that people do, which is to disambiguate that. And it's really tough. But the curious thing, I mean, da establishes subordination, right? But there's multiple kinds of subordination. But in gen I mean, I would guess in most cases, uh, a native speaker or even a non-native speaker would know from context, as it were, what the equivalent would be. So this, I mean, I'm wondering whether this is saying more about the nature of machine translation than about the understanding of language by human beings. Yeah, and the machine models are exactly trying to do the sort of context-based disambiguations that, that, mm -hmm. human do, that humans do. And the thing about it is that the humans uh, have to make use of semant deep semantic context to do the disambiguation, unlike in Western languages where you can actually not bother with the semantics and still be able to disambiguate it just on the surface features. Mm -hmm. But again, at, at the risk of, of, of repeating something, even though Chinese can be more ambiguous than English, it, if it can be as specific as it wants to. So from a certain point of view, it's not a deficit, but rather a greater number of opportunities. Absolutely. Because the, it's the, the, absolutely. It's not a judgment. It's just a quantified mm -hmm. measurement of the degree of ambiguity. Okay, not to get too specific, there's a distinction that we make between local ambiguity and global ambiguity, uh -huh. which I think is what you're getting at. Thank you very much, Lisa. It was a wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, Maybe the bridge between your talk and Bilahari's talk earlier would be useful. I, I, you know, particularly in answering uh, Durkai's question, 
on the quantification of uh, ambiguity in languages. Um, uh, Bilahari used the, line, used the word uh, fat red lines and thin red lines. Uh, let me put a proposition for you for your comment. The English language and Indo-Romanic languages, which are alphabetic, are able to define with very thin red lines, whereas actually the Chinese language has very fat red lines in, 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 in meaning, which therefore allows a transition, broad interpretations, and therefore phase transition into another meaning. What do I mean by phase transition? That means the, the, when you have, in diplomacy, this is why, where Bilahari comes in, he uses what is normally called constructive ambiguity. I say something which you're not quite sure exactly what I mean. Mm -hmm. And if we are able to find a common area within that fat red line, we've achieved diplomacy. Okay? Whereas in the Chinese, it always can be interpreted in so many ways we don't know what the real position is. I mean, I, mean I, I think philosophically, you know, could you clarify what you mean, you know, in, this, in, in that type of context? Well, I think that a Chinese speaker, if he or she wants to, wants to draw a thin red line, there are ways to do so. It may take more deliberate specification. In terms of everyday speech, I think I, I take the point. Um, I also think that, and I'm, I'm thinking out loud here, so this is going to be ill-formed, but I think there are also different cultural practices for drawing thick and thin red line. I mean, one is, in fact, the, the use of, of poetic quotation, I think, in both traditions, um, as a way to be constructively ambiguous. I mean, there are many, many examples in Chinese historical texts of ministers quoting a line of verse as a way of indirectly criticizing a ruler with absolute power. But there are also, I mean, diplomats, for example, are famous for being able to make the apt quotation. Um, and, and so that would strike me as a, as a, as a cultural practice of, of thick red lines. Um, if, however, for example, if you're an astronomer or you're a um, water conservation engineer, if you need to draw a very thin line, what line there are, I think, always ways to do it. So I'm, I'm, I'm still... Re resistant, I'm, I'm still skeptical of the idea that the language inherently forces one to draw lines of a certain diameter. A fat rate line or a thin rate line. I think the, 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 the concept of it is really this, whether you want to be inclusive or exclusive. You have a fat rate, rate line, you have bigger area of commonality. When you have a thin rate line, it's either left or right, white or black, no gray area. Mm -hmm. I think that's basically what I see. I think you, you are probably a better scholar than me in Chinese literature and philosophy. I, I look at Chinese texts as descriptive. Maybe the Western texts are fall into the danger of being generalizing, right? Uh, they tend to be prescriptive. So is ambiguity bad? Because ambiguity to me is really this. I draw the picture, it's up to you to how to interpret it. I raise more questions than I want to answer the questions. Uh, I, I project an image for you to think, ask the questions, and find the solution rather than the prescriptive text which say that, Champ, this is a clear picture, this is how you should do it, which is better. What do you think? Well, I'm uncomfortable with the idea that Chinese texts are descriptive or Western texts, whatever those are, are prescriptive. For example, if one reads Shunzi, I think it's pretty prescriptive. Um, um, one could even argue that if one reads Zhuangzi, it's pretty prescriptive, although what the prescription is might be very hard to determine. Um, and I think the other problem is that, that we need to deal with microclimates, that all, you know, China is not one place and the West is not one place. And it seems to me that one can find examples of both across these boundaries. Okay, next question. <laughs>
or let me just pose one, one question myself. Um, there's this idea uh, when people talk about ambiguity in politics that, um, that, that, that different cultures use ambiguity to, to avoid saying uh, certain things that would jeopardize the relationship. So, so like um, the, the the typical stereotype or generalization is that oh you know um, among the Asians they 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 were if they're very unhappy with one another they will never voice their unhappiness and and so they will keep things very uh, ambiguous for the sake of harmony and maybe the Western tradition they they will have ambiguity uh, in other areas but again it's you know for the sake of preserving some kind of other uh, some uh, harmony in some other area. Well, I completely agree that we use ambiguity for different things. And the, 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 the sites of ambiguity, I think, are probably very, very different. Um, but I would also guess that that's probably true within different parts of China, that people aren't univocal. And so I think it would definitely be true across, say, different parts of Europe. Certainly, I know it would be true in different parts of the US, which is rather a large place. Um, but, uh, but it seems that part of the interest is where people use ambiguity and for what. Okay. Well. I wonder if we could go back to the question of global versus local. Um, I'm sorry, I th th thought it was super interesting and I'd love to hear, first of all, maybe Doka, you could explain your, the definition and then maybe you could respond and see if that is indeed what you were talking about. Because it seems like a, it's a fascinating question. I, I think you probably know this already, Lisa, but uh, you know, like what we call local ambiguity is when there's um, something that if we do local analysis, for example, syntactic analysis, um, it looks like this is ambiguous. Um, but when you then look at the, con the context the, the, and the semantics and the pragmatics, you can use those features to actually disambiguate it with fairly high certainty. And so in that situation, we, we often say there's a local ambiguity. Mm -hmm. But in the global context, there's not much ambiguity because we can disambiguate it. And so that's what I thought maybe you were getting at um, about, well, China. So Chinese does seem to be a more efficient encoding. Oh, here's another interesting observation. Sorry, I'm going off on a tangent. Um, so one thing that we've done is information theoretically just sort of measure how many bits does it take to transmit the same idea using English and, and using Chinese. Because we've got millions and millions of sentences of highly um, uh, well translated um, pairs of, of uh, sentences in English and Chinese. So we can actually say for the same idea, on average, um, statistically significant, it takes almost twice as many bits, no matter how much we do compression, uh, to get the English message transmitted versus the Chinese message, um, which suggests that Chinese is a much more efficient encoding um, of the same idea. And it does so by dropping a lot of these explicit things which relies on the intelligence and general world knowledge of the listener to restore. It's like error correction. Um, so, okay, I, I'm gonna stop. Um, well, I think that the, the issue of local, amb of, of, sorry, of uh, local ambiguity is, is very interesting and important. And one thing that one notices, for example, if you read a book in Chinese and you read a book, a translation of the same book, it's what, about 50% longer in, English or French or whatever. Um, it's not computational, but just in terms of you know, page counts. Um, uh, it, I think, bears out a similar observation. Uh, I want to ask, uh, how do you differentiate between someone who intentionally uses ambiguity to convey the rich meaning versus someone who uh, uses ambiguity just because he doesn't know what he's talking about, and he just wants to pass off as an intellectual. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking of certain essay questions written by students, for example. <laughs> um, but again, this is, um, if, this is a, if you like, a, um, I think the answer to that would be, could be phrased in the language of local ambiguity. Um, the interesting thing, I mean, it's a really interesting question. I think there could be situations where it's not clear. So for example, if you have, say, a cultural interaction where you don't know the other person, uh, you don't know what they know. I could imagine a lot of situations where you wouldn't know. Um, has anyone seen a, a movie called Being There, starring Peter Sellers? This is a long time ago. It's about a man who seems to have been kind of an idiot, but he's taken as a sage. And he makes these sort of gnomic utterances. 
Um, uh, and it's, it's an extremely funny movie that only Peter Sellers could pull off. But it would be actually an, exam an example of this sort of thing where people repeatedly interpret one thing as another, lacking a context. And so I think that, um, and I think in a lot of situations, um, um, differences of context where you have discrepancies, I'm not, I'm not, and misunderstandings that arise from them create perceptions of ambiguity or misperceptions of ambiguity or misattributions. Um, so, and I, I suspect this happens in diplomatic contexts and in many, many um, everyday ones. But I think a lot of the time one can tell. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much, oh, Professor Lisa Rifos. Yeah.